Storytelling is probably one of the oldest and most crucial functions of human society that goes all the way back to, well, the beginning of us. And it really began even before we had written languages. Um, it was a way for uh, societies to pass along important information from one generation to the next. And of course, I guess you went from cave paintings to then eventually newspapers, and then eventually that brought us the internet. And even though the technology of storytelling has changed dramatically, the truth is the art of storytelling uh, has not changed so much. And its importance in our society is still as great as it has ever been. I'm Martin Savage with CNN, and today our conversation is about the impact of storytelling on social justice issues and wrongful convictions, wrongful accusations. And joining me for this conversation is Kent Alexander, former U.S. attorney and co-author of the book, The Suspect. Kevin Riley, who is the editor of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and Scott Maxwell, a columnist for the Orlando Sentinel. All of us, I guess I have to say, have been involved in in either handling cases of wrongful convictions or wrongful accusations or reporting on, on cases like that uh, or writing and telling stories about them. So I wanna begin by actually, whether you're an author or whether you are a reporter, you gotta make the pitch. Scott, I'll ask you, how difficult is it to pitch a story like this? I think these are some of the most difficult columns that I write and that is because uh, at the end of the day, if you take a movie like Just Mercy, everyone knows how that ends. Uh, the guy was wrongfully convicted, and we can all root for that person all along the way. The audience, our readers, your viewers do not know that with these stories. I don't even know it for sure a lot of the times when I'm launching on a story. And frankly, it's hard to get people to care or even believe uh, a lot of these stories. I think about my favorite definition of privilege. Privilege is when something doesn't strike you as a problem because it's not a problem to you. Well, most people have never been wrongfully convicted. They've never spent two decades behind bar. A lot of people have trouble believing it actually happens. And uh, one of the first attorneys I ever talked to who dealt with this and worked on this uh, more than a decade ago said, one thing almost everybody who's been wrongfully convicted has in, com has in common is they don't have anybody else. They don't have someone who sat in the courtroom and championed them their case the whole time uh, it was going on. They didn't have a big legal team, and often they are not sympathetic characters. They have blemishes on their track record uh, for something uh, else that's happened. Put it all together, it's sometimes a tough sell, uh, sell and you get a lot of skepticism. Yeah, well, let's, um, you know, Kevin, this is probably a good time to bring you in because you're the one that's often on the receiving end of these pitches coming from the reporters and that. Well, you know, I was smiling as Scott made his point because he's just so right, Martin. Uh, uh, you know, any great story, you know, that we love as human beings has good guys and bad guys and, and people like the good guys, right? So someone who's already in prison for decades, it's hard to hard to portray as a good guy and get people to identify with them. Um, Ken, you made the great point before we began, which is if you think it's hard making a pitch, you know, on a story, think about trying to make a pitch on a book. Talk about that. Uh, sure. Well, I was a prosecutor for 11 years, and one of the cases that I was charged with prosecuting was the Olympic bombing case. There's a guy, Richard Jewell, who discovered the bomb in 1996 at Centennial Park, saved a lot of lives, and now that seems like it's just uh, you know, gospel. Uh, but at the time, there's a lot suggesting he may be the bomber. So uh, the two pitches that come to my mind, one was, I mean, the FBI, and two, two publishers. With the FBI, uh, before it was entirely clear Richard Jewell was not the bomber, it just a number of people on my team, including Sally Yates, just we didn't think he did it. So that was a pitch. After it was all said and done and the real bomber at the Olympics 25 years ago turned out to be a domestic terrorist named Eric Rudolph, uh, my co-author Kevin Salwin and I decided to write a book called The Suspect about uh, the whole Jewell ordeal and also about Eric Rudolph. And particularly on the jewel piece, it just wasn't immediately clear to publishers that this was a story worth telling. We went through two rounds of being uh, just getting, getting thumbs down all around. It wasn't until the third round that the book hit and ultimately became a movie. But uh, it's, it's sort of tough because unless somebody's absolutely convinced, uh, A, they didn't do it with the FBI, and B, it's a story worth telling with a publisher, it's tough. I can't believe that uh, some editor would say, ah, I don't know about this one. Well, I've got a raft of beautifully written rejection letters I can share with you, but, <laughs> but basically it comes down to whether something will sell. And this was a sort of a, a Bubba kind of guy who's, uh, you know, 
white down on his luck. He wasn't particularly sympathetic or it didn't seem so at first. And it was just, the question was kind of, will, will anybody really, really care about someone named Richard Jewell? And it, it turns out ultimately it wasn't so much him, but what he stands for that people cared about the idea of a rush to judgment. Let me ask you, Kevin, the media here, we all ran with this story. And I'm wondering what the question is about whether we should have. Well, of course. I mean, it's a huge question. And I think, uh, I mean, I highly recommend Kent's book because it's the most thorough look at what happened. And, yeah, it is. Uh, really the way decisions got made and, and what happened. So here's what I think we're also up against. And, and the Richard Jewell case is definitely, uh, you know, gave us a preview of this. We have a society now that watches an episode of CSI where an incredibly complicated crime is wrapped up in an hour and everything fits neatly together. And I think they carry that expectation over to everyday cases and the, the, the things that happen in real Absolutely. life. And especially assume that, well, you know, if this guy went to prison for 20 years, they must have just had fantastic, you know, laboratory work and, you know, all this stuff that they see on shows like that. And those of us who cover this stuff, who pay attention to it every day, know that Cases, investigations, prosecutions are enormously complicated, take all sorts of time. And I just think that people run out of patience to understand things. And that's really why there can be such a rush to judgment, especially now on social media and other places where these things play out. One of the challenges I have is getting justice right can be really boring. Florida has wrongfully sent more people to death row uh, than any other state in America, 30 people. If you want to talk about the particulars of how you don't get things wrong, it means sort of the process. It means like we need to have rules for recording uh, suspect interrogations, which I've long advocated and which Florida does not have. It means you need to have rules for how you present photo lineups so that uh, investigators can't sort of point, is it this guy, this guy, or this guy, you know, to, to the uh, person they're asking to identify a suspect. This stuff is not sexy. And I think that we have a lot of people who sort of scream for justice, their uh, definition of justice, including the death penalty. But one of the things that I also tell them is that vengeance without accuracy is not justice, it's just bloodlust. And I think it's harder to get people to care about that process of being accurate because it's not terribly, you don't get instant gratification or sexy. And there are fortunately other examples of people who have been exonerated usually after a great deal of time. But when the story is reported, uh, it often can be perceived by the public or, or even in the telling of the journalist that this is a this is a positive, this is a feel-good story. This is a, you know, wow, this is a celebration story. And it's not, though, is it? it it's really telling us something very bad. I mean, we celebrate the fact that, okay, thank God we got this person out of prison. So there's no way, Kevin, that we should look at these as, as good news, joyful stories, right? Upon reflection, you know, of course, it's a, it's a failure of the system that fortunately was corrected. It makes you think about how many other failures are there and where are they? And more importantly, a guy at 20 years of his life, I mean, just take any 20 year period of your own life, whatever age you are, and imagine spending it behind bars. And yes, he's free now, but you cannot make up for those 20 years. It's just not, you know, it's just not possible. So I do think it's, those stories are absolutely bittersweet. I've seen figures that, that represent and say about anywhere from four to 6%, uh, maybe wrongfully incarcerated, which means, you know, there's a lot of people um, that are in jail or in prison at this time. We have to assume that uh, they're wrongfully there. Uh, it seems that sometimes it's a haphazard system as to how we discover this. Um, are we supposed to be comfortable with the way the system is right now? Oh, no jump in. You can't really be comfortable with a system that's doesn't uh, completely comfortable with a system that doesn't work perfectly, but I don't know that there is such a system. I certainly can't go with just tell, asking people, tell us if you're innocent or not, because you'll hear probably the majority of people in prison say they're not. Um, at the same time, you've got people making decisions on prosecution, and they're going to try to prosecute the strongest cases. So that, that narrows it a lot, but at the end of the day, you've got you know, humans at play and what and, and judgment at play. And that's the piece that I don't think you can ever get exactly right. So you know, between the Innocence Project and other groups that focus on economic disparity and 
racial animus and the rest, I think those groups at the margin are just do really important work. I think the way we ought to look at it is um, it does put a burden of responsibility on us as citizens, you know, wherever we stand, whatever our roles are in our society, prosecutor, defense attorney, journalist, average citizen, that we need to pay attention to this justice system. We need to care about it and support it and monitor it and, and try to make sure the best possible people serve in it. Um, because we're never going to have a perfect system, but it can only be great if we care about it. Uh, we should all be uncomfortable uh, with a lot of what happens in our, in our justice system. And, and one of the, some of the things we can do to improve that is we need to have better funding of our justice system. When prosecutors are overworked, when public defenders meet their defendants, for, uh, their clients for the first time at a trial, uh, we're not getting that robust uh, vetting of a case that we should do. This is quite a plug, but I encourage people to fund uh, groups like the Innocence Project, and that's not something I say often. In fact, I rarely write a column uh, that says at the end of the column, here's a group you should donate to. But the last time I wrote about a wrongful conviction, I did. And it's because of something else we talked about in this case. People read these stories, maybe it takes them 45 seconds or, or a minute, and at the end they say, oh, well, that is a feel-good ending. It took a lot more than 60 seconds to get to that feel-good ending. It took years. It may have taken a dozen attorneys. It may have taken investigators, and all that takes a lot of money. I think we all have a role to make the justice system uh, work a little bit better, and we should support those uh, that are trying to do so. We need to take an active role in many ways. We need the encouragement need to encourage the public to do the same. Storytelling is probably the best tool we have as journalists, as to say, this is why it matters. This is why you should get involved. And this is why it is so essential that the right person be convicted and not the wrong one. Um, thank you all for taking the time today.